Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Sav. And I'm Jess. And welcome to And a Diet Soda, episode 22, The Breakup We All Need. (laughs) Today's episode is all about ending emotional eating, healing your relationship with food, and officially breaking up with diet culture for good. Yes, I know. I love the title of this episode. It's just (laughs) perfect. Today's guest is Katrina Kofed, an anti-diet coach who focuses on helping people officially end their long-term fight with emotional eating while healing their relationship with food freedom. Um, she also just finished her master's. So yay, congrats to this lady. Worked very hard this last few months on finishing up her thesis and her, her defense, I'm sure. And it was just such a whirlwind for her. So we're very happy to have her here. Um, thank you so much for being here, lady. Hi, it's Sav and Jess. Welcome to And A Diet Soda, an opportunity for people to celebrate their successes, share their failures, and hopefully give a little advice on all things relatable along the way. This community is for appreciating the little things and fostering positive mindsets and intuitive thoughts by talking to people, because chances are they've been through it too. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this, so I'm glad we finally got to do it. Yes, we are too. We've been super excited. So we're just going to jump in. Um, Can you start by telling us a little bit about how you found your passion for nutrition and maybe even start by telling us a little bit about your story and just kind of what led you here? Yeah. So my story started about nine years ago. I was in high school and my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer and luckily they caught it pretty early. She had a double mastectomy, which is a pretty severe surgery. If you guys are familiar with it. And it really like, it, it was like, it rocked my world, right? Like as it would when, you know, your mom has cancer and luckily she's in remission now she's doing great. And, you know, it was, it was very much like a preventative surgery, but it really got me thinking about my risk for disease. And yeah. so Basically, that was like a huge wake up call for me. And all of the information I'd gotten up until that point in my life was like one in three people are going to get cancer. And it very much sounded like everyone's going to get it like sucks to suck, you know, which sounds brutal. But that's how it was like told to me. I was like, what? How is this like? How are we all accepting this? Like there, there's no way everyone is just okay with this. Right. So I went about my life, but really I was like searching for some kind of answer. I was like, someone must have something you can do. And I, my family's from Denmark. Um, but I was mostly raised in the U S but my, my whole family still lives in Denmark. So I went back to, to Copenhagen to go to cooking school for five months, which was really cool. And at that time, so I was learning how to cook, which was great. But one of our chef instructors was plant-based. So he told me all about a plant-based diet and the potential health benefits. And that was a big part of his story. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is like what I've been looking for in terms of like, there, there has to be something I can do. And this was something I could do. Right. So I really started learning more about nutrition and the impact that great nutrition can have on at least reducing your risk for a lot of chronic disease, especially some types of cancer. So that was really what got me into nutrition was because I went plant-based and I've been vegan pretty much ever since. So it's been like seven and a half years since then. And over the, over the time, my journey really went from being passionate about just nutrition. And so you and I were just talking about this, but like that there's so much more to well-being than food. And that is like my personal journey, right? So I got really into, into being excited about food and nutrition and what I was putting in my body, but I had no idea about the impact of mental health and emotional well-being on your total well-being. So this is where it went a little bit into like the left field for me, where I developed some disordered eating patterns around food and got like too obsessive, what we know as orthorexia, right? So it was really this very interesting journey where at the time, I mean, too, this was in like 2014, 2015, orthorexia has, was not like a common term whatsoever. I think that might've even been before it was coined. No one knew about like, you know, what, you, what is disordered eating? The eating disorders at the time were like anorexia and bulimia and like binge eating. Can you, can you elaborate on orthorexia? Cause I've actually never heard of it before. Yeah. So basically it's, it's newer, probably the most recently established eating disorder. That is just basically like an obsession with, with healthy, healthy eating and healthy living. So some symptoms are like feeling obsessive about food only like having to work out every single day, um, being really anxious. If you miss a workout, like you have to eat certain things, you freak out if you eat something that to you is unhealthy, like very much just extreme, like 
health wellness influencers. So there's a lot of people now online in the wellness space who are honestly promoting very disordered eating patterns that are disguised as healthy, which is like something I'm so passionate about now because that's not, it's not healthy at all. Like just because you might be eating a green smoothie and a salad, does not mean your mental health is in a good place? Like what is so short-sighted, right? So that was really like, I didn't know what was happening to me at the time, but all of that restriction, that's essentially what it was. You know, like I was like, you can only eat clean, eating clean. That's a big thing, right? Can only eat clean. And all that restriction then led me to develop this big problem with emotional eating. And during this time I was doing my undergrad in, I was double majoring in biology and psychology, which was a lot. I had also, um, I was really passionate about fitness. I'd become a group certified fitness instructor. So I was, I was doing a lot like in the health and fitness realm. And then that led me to see how messed up the fitness industry is, right? Like talk about an industry that is focused on aesthetics and appearance and very much like toxic language around like burn your love handles or like smash the muffin top. Like, I can't even think of like, it's so bad. Right. But that's like what the, and still, if you go to fitness classes, that's what some of these instructors say. And I'm just like, what is this? Like, what are we telling people that they should be getting up and going to these workout classes at 5.00 AM instead of getting a good night's sleep so they can burn 300 extra calories? Like, how are we not seeing the bigger picture? Right. So Throughout my undergrad and throughout my own experiences with my personal struggle and, and realizing how restrictive my eating patterns and my exercise, like I was over exercising in the past too. I, I like very much came to this understanding of like, that was not healthy. It might have been physically healthy. I might have looked fit, but mentally not a healthy space to be in. Right. So thankfully I was studying psychology too, which I was really passionate about. And, um, all of that led me to this point where I graduated and I was like, okay, there's so much more to health and well-being than just good nutrition and good exercise. Like everyone liked to think it was right. There's mental health and emotional health, right? Like it's very much a trifecta. And of course there's like, there's kind of the seven pillars of well-being, but that's more of like a very much bigger picture in terms of your environment and your career satisfaction, financial health, right. But mental, emotional, physical, excuse me. Yeah. Physical, mental, emotional, right. So that was really, I got to this point where I was like, this is what matters. This is what I want to share with people. And I wanted to study a master's in nutrition because I had been like oscillating back and forth. Should I do this? Should I not? And so we were kind of just talking about this, about like, what do you do with a nutrition degree, right? Like normally you, be, you become a nutritionist and go help people just with their food. So my thing was I had become an ACE certified health coach too. That was over two years ago now because I knew that I wanted to start my coaching practice, helping people. And I knew I had the skills to do so despite not having a master's degree yet. Right. Like I was like at two, two degrees under my belt. I know so much. I have a lot of experience in the industry. I worked as a health educator at a clinic, um, before that. So I was like, I feel very well equipped to start helping people. Um, but how do I do that in a way where it's very holistic and it's focused on your overall lifestyle without just being nutrition. So Long story short, I, I graduated from my master's program in human nutrition, which is very exciting. Um, and it's been a very, very full, what is the, what's the word? Full circle moment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Everything's yeah. full circle. I think we're yeah. the same person. We have some, we have like been <laughs> so much of the same. It's yeah. funny. It's really ironic. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not the only one going through these things. That's a good feeling. That's what I feel. <laughs> so many nutritionists and dietitians get into it. And I've seen so many, just like, I follow quite a few people online, you know, over the years, so many of us across the board have come and been like, yeah, I actually had an eating disorder and I didn't realize it. Right. Like orthorexia has been huge in the, in recent years because wellness industry was promoting so much of it. Right. And we didn't even know what the problem was. So it's like, it's great that, I mean, obviously it sucks. We all had to go through that, but it's great. At least now we're like talking about it and recognizing the problem that it is. And the like anti-diet culture and, you know, food freedom movement is becoming a bit more commonplace. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, the health industry as a whole is a bit like throwing glitter on shit, right? Because it's like all painted as a pretty picture. Right. And, and But what we talk about on this podcast too, and I actually really want to hear your opinion on this, like, where is that line for you? Like, how do you toe the line between being health conscious, being working out, eating right, and making sure that you don't tip over that edge? Yeah, that's a great question. My clients ask me that a lot because I think a lot of people have, a lot of clients I work with have struggled with dieting. They struggle with emotional eating. It's very much all or nothing. It's very much completely on the bandwagon or completely off. And there's like no in between. So I think 
people are either used to, if you've been on a diet or if you've imposed your own restrictive patterns, like on yourself, like I did, then it's like, you have a very rigid set of rules that you follow. Right. So like, if you're doing whole 30, there's a bunch of food you can't eat. Right? And that's like, those are the rules you follow. And those are the guidelines that you follow. And it probably leaves you binging then when February 1st rolls around and, and you go back to those habits. But then people think it's either like it's whole 30 or it's nothing, or it's keto or it's nothing, or it's pale, whatever it is, or it's intermittent fasting or it's nothing. When in reality, I like to use the concept of just like structured guidelines. So it's more guidelines. It's not hard rules for having those more health conscious patterns. So I like, I like to say I, for the most part, eat whatever I want because I do eat the foods that I, I truly want to eat, right? Like I'm not going to, if I don't feel like having a salad, I'm not going to have a salad, but I do have these guidelines in place that make sure that I'm making nutritious choices. And that's just, I make, I make nutritious whole foods, plant-based choices for pretty much most of my meals. And if I want some potato chips with my dinner, then I have it right. Like, it's just, it's a very like simple thing. And it's kind of operating off the 80, 20 principle, I think too, um, where about 80% of your food is more nutritious and more physical health promoting. And then the other 20% can be a little less nutritious, maybe a little more processed, but is supposed to be part of the joyful part of eating, right? So in terms of how can, how can you know, the average person off the street kind of implement that, I really think it's thinking about going back to basics because most of us have been so clouded by all the nutrition BS that's online and diet BS that's online, right? Just going back to basics, we all can agree that fruits and vegetables are generally healthy, right? So eating more of those, can you find like less processed sources of protein? Can you start to incorporate some plant protein, like whole grains, you know, like it's not really rocket science anymore. There might be general like disagreement about what's the best diet ever, but, but we shouldn't, I don't think we should be getting caught up in those details. It's like make healthy choices for you. And don't feel bad when you go out and have a burger and drinks on like a Saturday night, right? Because that stress and that guilt of that meal might lead to more binging. It's probably going to cause you more anxiety than the burger would have done on its own if you had just eaten it and like moved on with your life. So that's my philosophy. I appreciate you saying that. I have another question bouncing off of that because I was talking to one of my friends and she was, we've, she listens to the podcast. We've talked about it multiple times. We've talked about binge eating and she was like, yeah. Like I, last night I knew I was like, I wanted a donut and I fought myself so hard and I did it. I ate everything else that I could find and still ended up eating two donuts. And I'm like, I don't know. I still don't know why I'm doing that to myself. I, I, I know that I can just eat it, but I still won't allow myself to. So, um, I don't know if you can comment on that at all or how to get through a situation like that, because I mean, I feel like no matter how far into it, we are, sometimes we're like, when we label a food as bad or society labels a food as bad, it's really hard sometimes to push through yeah. that. And that's a big thing. It is very much, I mean, I call it, I call it like cognitive rewiring is what we're doing. Like that's what I do with clients. A lot of clients come to me and they're like, and just in our initial call, they'll be like, oh, I can't eat this. It's bad. And I'm like, it stop right there. Ding, yeah. ding, ding. <laughs> no food is good or bad. Earlier I said some foods are more nutritious or they might be more physically health promoting. So in terms of obviously we can't adopt that mindset overnight, but like a journaling exercise I have my clients do is write down what foods come to mind that you think are bad. So it might be donuts, ice cream, french fries, soda, chips, candy, burgers, right? Write them all down. Why do you feel like they're bad? Because someone told me they were unhealthy. Are they really unhealthy? Anything is going to be anything that's highly processed and, and high in fat and sugar and calories is going to be physically unhealthy if you consume way too much of it. And that's like the majority of what you eat. Sure, that's true. But is that your rate of consumption? Chances are for most of us, it's not. There are some people who are consuming a lot of highly processed foods. And that's like, sure, there's room for improvement there, right? Mm -hmm. But really like walking through that process of why is this food bad? Is it really that bad if I'm having a burger once or twice a month? Is it really that bad if I were to have like one donut? One, even once a week, right? Like it's not that bad. And, and recognizing too, like if you're eating generally healthy food, if you're eating fruits and vegetables and whether it be like lean meat or plant protein and whole grains and like drinking water and, you know, like we're all doing pretty okay. If you can do those things and get good sleep and manage your mental health and drink water and exercise, like you're doing great if you're doing all those things. So that one donut is not going to derail you. It's not bad it's fulfilling your, your general like desire to live your life and feel satisfied. Right. So that's a big thing too, is that your meals have to be satisfying because that's, a, that's so common with, with binge eaters is 
you'll try to eat everything healthy. You'll try a healthy substitution for the donut. It's not going to, it's just not going to hit the same, like have the donut and move on with your life. Right. Like you probably consumed like 500 calories on the way to the donut. So why not just bypass, bypass that and just get to the donut and then you'll, you'll be satisfied. And then you won't be stressed about all that mental, like hardship you just had to endure to get there so that's very much easier said than done everyone really has to practice that and that's like something I work with clients on and it's we go through this like multiple times right because it takes time to integrate but really anyone can start there absolutely I'm Um, I'm that way I'm like I or I used to be that way and I love that you have like the psych background because it really makes a difference and I think it it really helps clients because it's important to understand why you're doing things as well um and I, I think this is a good way to kind of go into the emotional eating aspect, but as far as emotional eating goes, can you explain what that is and why somebody might be inclined to do that? And maybe some signs that they might be able to notice in their life to kind of show them that they are experiencing that. Yeah. Great question. So emotional eating can really be a broad number of things, but basically it's eating that you do directly as a result of the way that you're feeling. And usually it's negative emotions, but not always. So some common examples are going to be eating when you're stressed, eating when you're exhausted, um, eating because you're bored, eating because you're happy and you're celebrating, like you've got good news. Okay. Champagne or chocolate cake, like whatever it is, that's less common, but that happens for people too. But a lot of the time, the most common ones I see are eating because you're stressed, bored, or tired. Like if you're exhausted, if you're, if you're pretty burnt out, if you're chronically stressed, food is a big thing that we use to try to get ourselves through. Right. And then of course there's, I think there's a decent number of people who just, a lot of us have been working from home for the past year and a half. So you just eat out of habit, right? So there's more like the habitual eating that, oh, you just get up and wander into the kitchen in between your meetings during the day. And then all of a sudden, you know, maybe you've gained 10 pounds over a few months. You're like, how did I get here? Right. So Mm -hmm. it's not always like, it's not always super deep for people, but often it can be. Um, Some other reasons too are sometimes it's loneliness or anxiety or general like unfulfillment, right? Like not feeling purposeful with your life. That's, that's a very, pretty deep reason that a lot of people emotionally eat. And that was one of the reasons that I realized that I was struggling with emotional eating was feeling lonely and just unfulfilled. Right. So that's something where if you were to ask someone, like, why are they doing this? Chances are, they're not going to be able to tell you right in that moment, like why they're doing this. Right. But it doesn't feel good. And it's probably going to take a lot of reflection to get to the point of if it is that like loneliness, like, wow, okay, this is actually what I'm experiencing. Cause that's a painful emotion for any of us to have to feel. So if it's boredom or if it's just habit, or if you're tired and it's 5 PM, you wanted a snack and to lay on the couch and scroll and TikTok, like, okay, we've probably all been there like at least once. Right. So that's a bit different, but that's pretty much like what emotional eating is. What are the feelings? How to know if you're doing it is if you feel like you're out of control around food, or you feel like compelled to go eat this food or when you start eating you feel like you can't stop right so it kind of can get over some people who struggle with emotional eating also have binge eating disorder and and a lot of people are just emotional eaters more in the sense where it might be affecting your self-esteem you might have gained some extra weight that's making you feel really self-conscious um but it's not necessarily over into the full spectrum of an eating disorder right so it's interesting because there's a lot of different ways that people emotionally eat. And and because of that, there are a lot of different strategies you kind of have to think about because what works for one person is not going to work for the other. So that's a bit of, that's, I mean, that's kind of your mantra, right? Is like what making, making it work for the individual person. Yeah. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit on how every person is different and how you work with your clients? Absolutely. So it's really, I mean, a bunch of my clients have struggled with emotional eating and that's a big part of why they work with me. And so for some of them, like for one of my clients, it's because she is burnt out and exhausted. So she eats because she's completely KO'd when she gets home at the end of the day. So then for her, it's really backtracking and saying, okay, where can we reduce sources of stress in your life? So with stress, it's very much where can you reduce the sources of stress, which might be very challenging because most of us can't just quit our jobs or like go on a you know permanent vacation. So that's a little harder, but where can you also incorporate more stress relieving you know, habits? And then three, where can you change your perception of stress, right? So those are some things. So for her, it's really working on more self-care. It's working on how can from very, you know, you guys will get this from a very biological level, how can we help get your body back into the parasympathetic nervous system response? So your fight or flight isn't going off all the time. And your body's not like freaked out because you're exhausted and stressed and anxious and like running. (laughs) 
right? So that's true for a lot of people. So, so very much from like the stress approach, that's what we're doing for her. And now she's having way less emotional eating because we've taken care of the root problem. So it's not solving diets are like, we know this diets are such a band-aid. diets are so, you know, she could have gone on a diet and, and forced herself willpower through to not eat. As soon as she gets off the diet, the problem's back in full force, right? But you address the problem at, at the root and then, okay, things get better, like magical. Yeah. And then for other people where it's, it's more emotional, where it might be that loneliness or that unfulfillment. I mean, I, I, I was telling you this, Sav, and Jess earlier that I talk with clients about everything, right? Like, I think sometimes what I do very much borders more on like life coaching because I'm like, we're talking about everything. I want to know about your relationships. I want to know about your boundaries. I want to know about your self-care. How do you think about yourself? What are your beliefs about yourself? Right. Because then I can really see, okay, well, I can see how this directly is impacting why you're eating. Right. Because you feel this way. Maybe you feel unfulfilled in this way. Maybe you feel like you're not good enough in some way. So if you feel like you're not good enough anyway, if your self-esteem and your belief in yourself is really low, it's easy to say, well, whatever, I'm never going to be good enough. Let me just go eat right? Like, let me at least have this temporary satisfaction. So then we kind of get into more addressing that and like, how, why is that not true? How can you start to do some of the things that would make you feel better? So you can see it's very, some of these are really deep. Some of the other ones are like, okay, girl, bath time, go to bed earlier. Like stop texting that guy back. You know what I mean? Like it's very, (laughs) it can be super like a little more surface level and other times it's real deep. Shit. That's so. awesome. You must have so much fun getting to know your clients and treating them because you're really like you're 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 recognizing that like this there's a human being attached to that mouth and that esophagus and that stuff. Yeah, and totally. It's just what it is. It's like you've got to look at it as a whole, and that's such a thing so obvious hearing you talk about it, but people just don't do it. And I think too, especially like in the, I mean, Sav, you have your background in medical nutrition, especially in the medical field. Like people are used to health professionals, like in a clinical setting being like, how much do you weigh? What's your BMI? Like, no wonder everyone hates going to the doctor. Cause it's a very, it can be very triggering. If you have, there's a lot of like weight stigma and weight bias, right. Just for, for people who are struggling with overweight alone. Right. So it's just like, we have to, I mean, it sounds so obvious, but you have to look at people as a person because we are. Absolutely. They have a heart, they have emotions. That's always so hard. I think it's one of the hardest parts about working in this field at all is uh, People do hate on BMI and I can understand how uncomfortable it is. I I've experienced like calculating BMIs for people and how experience, how uncomfortable it is. But on the other side, it's like, listen, as long as we can get you to like a healthy metabolic place, we can mm-hmm. work from anything there, but we also want to focus on your health. And so it's, so it's just like this teeter totter. It's just like, that's Absolutely. one of the things that's so challenging in the clinical aspect of it. it um, hopefully we can really start to change that in this field too, and start to push it towards, listen, this is just like a metric. So we can see and make sure that you are healthy, that your heart's healthy. We can, you know, look at your blood work, look at hormones, whatever it may be, but really change it to a metric instead of defining somebody, because unfortunately that's what it is right now. So, um, sorry, bouncing back a little bit off of my soapbox now, um, as far as, nutrition and exercise together. How do you talk to your clients? How do you talk to yourself and work towards not allowing those things to become obsessions? Because obviously we know how easy it is. And I know firsthand how easy that is to become an obsession. And, um, I think one of the hardest aspects is when you do eat healthy and you do exercise and you're like, you actually feel good. And you're like, wow, like, I just, I want to feel good. I want to keep getting better, but then it starts to become really damaging and you're self-sabotaging. So how do you, how do you work with people through that? So the biggest sort of the, the structure and guideline I have for myself, which I came to after years of over-exercise and restriction, right. Was like, I'm living my healthy lifestyle. I, I got to this point. I had this epiphany a few years ago where I was like, health is not health and wellness is not this continual, like pursuit. You're not, it's not this never ending mountain of health that we're all aspiring to. Although the wellness culture would love us to believe that. Right. Cause then they can sell us more very expensive supplements. Right. But like, it's not like you're not constantly getting into better and better and better and better health. Like you get to a great, a place of great health 
and then you stay there. Like that's, that's kind of the way I see it. Maybe it fluctuates a little, but you get to great health and then you maintain it. So once I realized that, which seems, I know so obvious, but it was a big deal for me. I was like, what am I like, what are you aspiring to at this point? Like, I realize that the reason I, I live such a healthy lifestyle and have, have, you know, nutrition and fitness that makes me feel great is so that I can go do everything else with amazing mental clarity so that I can feel wonderful. Right. Like I have great peace of mind, very calm, like generally very little to no anxiety. So just, you know, this is probably now that my thesis is done. So, you know, situational anxiety out of the situation, like out of the, the conversation, but I have these health habits in place so that mentally I can feel great. I can have the energy and I can have the clarity to go do what I want to do in life and like in my business. Right. So for me, that means like how, because I want to go climb Machu Picchu and not have a problem with it. Right. Like, let me go do these things that I want to do. So really that's like my, my philosophy for why, why do we have healthy habits is to feel good and to enjoy the life that we have. And I know, you know, we all have to work, we all have to do things, but what is it that you want to do? Right? Like we all want to, I want everyone to be able to do those things into old age. So, and that's what I tell clients. I'm like, I want to be able to call you up in 20 years and you're doing literally better than ever because you have such a healthy foundation for your life because of the work we did that you can maintain your, your habits like long into old age. Right. I used to make this joke with, with my clients that I was like, I will be around till I'm a hundred years old because that's my goal is not being like super ultra shredded or fit in this moment. It's to like, just have a health, like a happy, healthy lifestyle that I can maintain for like decades down the road. So really when it comes to how do you find that balance for yourself? I think it's like, ask yourself, some of us have a lot more reason to maybe pursue a more intense, like nutrition regimen. Like, you know, if you've just gotten a diagnosis that you're type two diabetic or your cholesterol is high, or maybe you have risk of heart disease, or maybe it is a cancer thing. Okay. That's, that's pretty serious. Obviously then you would need a regimen that's going to address that. Right. But for the majority of us who are free of chronic illness, it's ask yourself, why am I doing this? If you're doing this to feel good, what else makes me feel good from a mental health and emotional health perspective? And, and a big part of that is like our social environment, right? So are your relationships fulfilling? Are you somewhat at least fulfilled by the work you do? And if not, how can you incorporate hobbies and other aspects that are going to make you feel fulfilled? Because it's great. Like I said, it's great to be drinking the green juices and going to the spin classes. But like, if you're feeling like you don't have, you're lacking social connection, that's, that's directly impacting your health too. And your physical health, right? So making it a well-rounded picture and asking yourself, how can I like have this be a well-rounded picture and not just obsessing about exercise or food is, is really a great way to start. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I think this like needs to, I don't know how we're going to make this blow up, but like, I <laughs> To hear that that is so viral yeah. yeah right that is such an important way to look at things and you just like epitomized it and and said it so beautifully and so actually that transitions pretty perfectly because I I wanted to ask you you mentioned it at the beginning social media can be such a positive such a great way to make connections but it can also be so negative I mean there are countless influencers out there, nutrition, fitness, all of the above. Um, and there's this wealth of knowledge. And, and then on the other side of that, there are people like us, Sav and I, or other people, even, I mean, who are completely new to the nutrition and exercise, who have never stepped foot in a gym, who are looking at all these different accounts, trying to decipher information into truths and valuable information versus all the ads and misinformation. Um, so what are your thoughts on that overall? <laughs> I think it's hard. I mean, I think, again, it comes back to, we, and we know this, right? But most people will never think of this. Most people who are like, oh, that, that bag of chips is so unhealthy, right? They're never, they're not thinking about the fact that like the majority of, of Americans live in a food deserts, right? Like that they have no access to like fresh groceries, right? Like most people aren't thinking about that when they say these things online. And the same goes for a lot of these like influencers or, you know, we all know influencers have these weird aspirational lifestyles that the majority of people won't be able to reach. But the thing is we know that and can like critically realize that. Whereas a lot of people, especially when it comes to wellness, might see that and be like, oh, whoa, whoa, I need to be drinking the $8 matcha latte and taking the very expensive supplements and like buying whatever weird thing from like wh whatever online, you know, bougie from goop or whatever it is to be healthy. When in reality, it's like, stop. All of that is like so extraneous, right? So it can be very overwhelming, but I think that's when 
again, I, this is what I tell people when they come to, like clients will message me and be like, I heard this thing. Like, what is it true? Like earlier today, my client was like, I heard someone said that light, like low fat dressings are bad. Like, should I be eating regular fat? And I was like, it's just hold on, like scroll back, like pause, right? Like, like remember how we don't say things like bad, right? <laughs> well, just like start, like okay, like erase that. I totally get it. We all have a bunch of influences coming at us, but remember the one thing we all know, we all know this is that vegetables are healthy and whole foods are going to be better than processed foods. So I'm like, whether you're starting with like zero knowledge of nutrition. I would say stay off Instagram and, you know, at least like try to find people that are reputable, which is tough. But the way I, I tell people this too, I'm like, the way, you know, if someone is reputable is one in nutrition and wellness, health, fitness is one, are they credentialed and or educated probably at least both in what they're doing. So to me, and Sav and I were talking about this, I'm a, I'm a health coach and a nutritionist. And both of those things, both those terms are completely unregulated, which is hard for me <laughs> as someone in the industry, because it comes with like kind of a lot of negative connotation because there's plenty of people out there giving us a bad name because they have no education and background in actual evidence-based nutrition. And then they spew all kinds of things. And then it reflects poorly on, on us as professionals. Right. So that's really where you have to be a conscious consumer and, and realize who are you consuming information from? Does this health person, do they actually have a degree in what they're talking about? Like, do they have any sort of background to any basis to be giving you literal health advice, right? Like we take health advice, like it's like, it's, I don't know, recipe recommendations <laughs> when in reality, like you would never go to just like anyone up off the street and ask them to like fix your car. Like when your car is broken, you take it to a mechanic. You know what I mean? And that's, that's so true. obvious. And maybe not everyone does that, but majority of us do. And that's obvious for most of us, but it's like, we can't just be taking health advice all willy nilly. So just being very mindful, I think. And whenever you do start to get overwhelmed, like ask yourself, is this, I like to think of it as zoomed in and zoomed out. Like if you're zoomed in on what type of kale is better for you, like, bro, that's too much. Like zoom out. Kale is fine. Just like just eat the kale, just eat, eat the, the kale, kale and move on <laughs> with your day, you know? Right. Right. I, I love that. So your professional Instagram is at passion for plants and it's created such a great space for supporting women and in, in breaking up with diet culture in your words, which is amazing. I love that. Um, can you tell us about how you started that community and why you are so passionate about it? So passion for plants, you know, it's interesting because it's a, it, it's kind of, I started passion for plants when I was super into plant-based eating and I still am. It's still a very big part of what I do and part of the work I do with clients. But initially I started my health coaching business because, and it actually started as a food blog, which don't we all at some point start as food bloggers, right? Yeah, <laughs> Pretty funny. But so it started because I had this passion for, for plant-based eating and for this vegan lifestyle because it had done so many things for me. Right. Um, and I really wanted to share that with people, but over the years, and especially like over the past year and a half, I was always more passionate about like, I want to help people find a balance with their lifestyles and, and heal the relationship with food. And that was always apparent in the work I was doing, but it wasn't the main focus. So it's really been over, over the past year that that's like shifted. And so now it's at this point where passion for plants is like what my company is. And, and I love the name and I don't think I'm going to change it, but it's funny because it's not, it's not at odds with what I do, but it's like, it's evolved. Right. But right. I think that's, that's part of the story is that it has evolved. And now I get to help people like in such a holistic sense with everything that they're doing. Um, instead of just like, Hey, again, let's focus on just the nutrition. Right. right. So right. that's been huge though. I think cultivating, and I mean, you guys are familiar with this cultivating a community online is really connecting with people. So I'm like talking to my audience all the time, like on TikTok, I do a bunch of videos and people ask questions and I get to reply to that, you know? So it's really like, how can I, how can I help you? What questions do you have? And really to me, like earlier, you guys asked, how do you know if you're emotionally eating? And to me, I'm like, well, isn't that obvious, but it's not, of course. Right. So you really have to meet people where their awareness level is at. And I think it just comes back to empathy. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what gratitude journaling is and how it's helped you? I've I'm also certified in mindfulness coaching. And so that. this is super exciting to hear about. That's awesome. I love that. Well, gratitude journaling, I think it's funny because it's a bit of a cliche now because it's maybe been a little overdone again online, but I think it's like, 
it, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like it's a great thing to incorporate if you can get over that hump of like, it feels very cliche, right? Yeah. So gratitude yeah. journaling for me was one of the things that really helped shift my whole like mindset and perspective on life. And it's easy to be like, what are you grateful for? Like, oh, you know, like my family, like my home, but really like think about it when you think about all that we have and all the opportunities that we have available to us. And when you start to like implement that every day for years, it really makes such a difference in how you view life. Right. And like how your perspective is on life and very much like glass half full optimist. Right. You can tell that. But I also think it's just at the end of the day, for me, I'm like my mind, I'm the only one living in my head. So it needs to be an enjoyable place for me to be. It needs to be a positive and welcoming and warm place for me to be. And gratitude journaling among other things, but gratitude journaling is like a huge, one of those things that helps me get there. So even I try to do grad, I try to journal most mornings and my, my rule of thumb is like, if you can do just three things that you're grateful for, and it can be however short or long you want it to be. But if you can do that, at least that's like, you are rewiring your brain to start to look for the good things, right? To start to look at the glass half full. And I think that's a great thing that any of us can do. That's great. I love my um, undergrad thesis. Well, my undergrad was in neuroscience and my thesis was on neuroplasticity. So oh, I think it's awesome. so cool so to bring that about in. It. Yeah, yeah. I'm, obs- I'm a little obsessed with that aspect myself. <laughs> I love neuroplasticity. It's so cool. I'm like, I tell people and clients, I'm like, we're just rewiring your brain. Like quite truly, yeah. it's like, it's like hardware and we're, we're changing it. it. We're changing it. So it's going to take time. People love to feel, de- you know, everyone feels defeated. If like you try something twice and it doesn't stick, but yeah. I'm like, it's okay. Literally your brain had a highway of coming home and going straight to the couch to watch Netflix and scroll on your phone. Yes. And now you're building a new highway of coming home and going to the gym or going for a walk, whatever it is. Like, it's going to take time to build that new highway. Right. So, right. And they have to recognize that. too, that it takes a lot of energy for your brain to do this. And so you're going to feel tired. You're going to feel like that sluggish feeling. It's going to take a while to get there and then you'll start to really feel it. So it's just about pushing through all of that. Um, So what tips would you give for those in different stages of life? Uh, I know that we have a lot of parents who listen, a wide range of ages. And of course, life changes so much and it's challenging to eat healthy and also we've talked about it before on the podcast. If you're just, as you go through your different stages of life, we've talked about our teenage bodies, how we all thought we were fat in high school and how that's a joke. Um, and as we go into our college bodies and our women bodies and how everything just changes constantly. So I think, especially to parents, parents, anyone with children, right? My advice, clients will come to me and they're like, okay, so I want to, I have all these health goals, which is wonderful. And then they're like, but my kids won't touch a vegetable within like 10 feet. And I'm like, I get it. Trust me. It's okay. But what you got to do is put on your own oxygen mask first. Right. So very much like take care of yourself, feed the kids what they were eating, because chances are, if you're a parent, especially if you have at least one young child, you are overwhelmed and you probably don't get enough sleep and you're probably a a little or a lot burnt out. So like you can't, you're not going to do all this overnight. You're not going to overhaul your family's eating patterns overnight. Focus on yourself. Just focus on incorporating some more vegetables, focus on getting better sleep, right? Like whatever, choose one or two small things to start with that you can do that just you can do for you and doesn't have to be for the kids and for the whole family. So that's my biggest thing for parents, like start small because you already have so much on your plate that you are completely going to get overwhelmed if you try to do everything at once. Yeah. And what I also have noticed with parents, specifically mothers who are really like taking care of kids a lot is they, they don't eat enough. Like they don't even remember, like they don't even have time. And I'm, that's the hardest I think is when you're just like, I, I eat maybe like two meals a day because I'm just running around and there's a lot going on. And so then it's like, it's also fearful for some of them when I'm like, okay, well, we need to, we need to eat food is fuel. We need to eat more. And they're like, (gasps) Like it's a little scary. Yeah. Well, especially because a lot of, uh, you know, if they're newer moms, a lot of new moms or moms at many phases of life are trying to lose weight. So then when you tell someone who's trying to lose weight that they need to eat more, you really have to overcome that whole mental block of actually 
chances are you're kind of shooting your metabolism in the foot a little bit if you're way under eating and also not sleeping enough and just so there's a lot to that's going on there right but it's like if you're not eating enough can you make a protein shake in the morning right like it can be easy if you have this is so funny it makes me think of one of my clients last year she was literally making her kid a like five star like fruit cut out like breakfast every morning and she like wouldn't eat anything and i was like girl pull it together your kid can have a three-star fruit plate and you can have like a two-star breakfast like it's better than nothing right so she was like she would send me pictures and it was so it was beautiful but very over the top I was like you have to feed yourself too like who's taking care of your family like it's you right so for parents like it's super funny I know I'm like for parents you got to remember you're the one like driving the car like you have to take care of yourself right um for other people in other stages of life, I think a lot of us have a huge transition post-college going, maybe going for more active lifestyles to more sedentary, more corporate jobs. And that's a big deal because all of a sudden you're not moving. All of a sudden you're working like maybe eight to five or nine to five. And then, you know, maybe you go to drinks with your friends after work. And then all of a sudden you're not exercising and maybe eating out more. So it can kind of hit you 15 pounds down the road or when you feel sluggish or just tired. So then again, it's asking, okay, where can I incorporate a little bit more right now? Where could I maybe do some meal prep, right? Like, could I, I'm a huge fan of like smoothies and protein shakes just because they make life easy. Most of us, it's rare that I meet someone who's not busy, right? So most of us are busy and, and smoothies make your life easier, right? So where can you just do one thing? I really recommend like focus on one to two strategies at most that you feel are doable for you. And it's not, okay, I'm going to start going to CrossFit five days a week when I haven't worked out in two years. It's, okay, maybe I'm going to try this new class that my friend has been telling me about. And then maybe I'm going to look into gym memberships that are nearby so that maybe I can start lifting weights again. Right. Like maybe I'll start by going on a 20 minute walk after work. Right. Like it be realistic with yourself. We all know, well, we might not all know smart goals, but one of the biggest things about smart goals is realistic and attainable for you. So make it attainable for you, not attainable for whatever fitness influencer you follow on Instagram. Yes. Okay. So, uh, if you would like to announce our challenge for our listeners this week, that would be great. So the challenge for listeners this week is to practice gratitude journaling. And I promise it can be simple. You might be rolling your eyes, but it can be very easy. And I might even guarantee that it'll probably change your mindset if you can do it for seven days straight. So the challenge is three things that you write down every single day, ideally in the morning, but it doesn't have to be, it's better done than not at all. It can be as short as you want. It can be longer if you're ready to wax poetic, right? But keep it short, do it every day and see how you feel at the end of the seven days. And tag me at Passion for Plants if you do or message us so we can know how you feel. But we've loved everything that you've told us and I know that all of the listeners will love it and we just appreciate you and your time. We know your advice is gonna help so many people create some new habits, even just kickstart their their journeys. So thank you so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. Thank you ladies for having me on. This was so fun. You can find Katrina on Instagram at Passion for Plants. Check out her educational series. Um, You can find her on Instagram. So become a part of our family um, and community on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all the things, YouTube at Anda Diet Soda. Um, Thank you so much again, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We hope you were able to give yourself a little love today. You deserve it. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and check us out on social media for weekly conversations and attainable challenges for your health.